Well, it is the weekend, ladies and gentlemen. And when it is the weekend, it's time for Michael Snyder and his movie reviews. Hello, Michael. Well, hello, Alex, and hello from Hollywood. How you doing, man? I'm doing okay. I'm surviving, as you are. We do the best we can, and boy, you need survival skills to sit through some of these films early in the year, I tell you. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, we've been taking a brief hiatus from uh, GabNet, and uh, so we're back, and we'll do a couple of uh, films that are in theaters now and also stuff opening this weekend. Yeah. Uh, let's start with Hot Tub Time Machine 2. Mm -hmm. uh, same director, mm -hmm. but oh, my God. Uh, if you recollect the other film, pretty funny, kind of crazy, kind of wacky, kind of pop culture madness with uh, John Cusack, uh, Rob Corddry, uh, Craig Robinson, and Clark Duke is uh, four, uh, you know, uh, compadres who find themselves uh, in miserable circumstances. And through the magic of a, a hot tub in a chalet, they're able to go back in time and try to fix their lives. And of course, everything does end happily. And it has a certain sort of consistency to its uh, uh, sci-fi principles. And it's funny. I thought it was pretty funny. And everybody did a great job. Um, so they go to the well or the tub one more time. And no, doesn't work. No sign of John Cusack. He's pretty much replaced by TV's um, ineffectual Adam Scott as the straight man. And uh, Cordry uh, is over the top to the point where you want him to stop. Uh, they decide that their lives need another fix, particularly his life when um, his success is being threatened. So they get into the hot tub and go into the future. And, oh, uh, you know, you, you kind of want these films to to work as sequels. Back to the Future 2, not bad. Back to the Future 3, not quite as good. But Hot Tub Time Machine 2 was uh, execrable, uh, unfunny, strained, and, uh, you know, I wish they hadn't done it. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, what did you think of the first one? Did you like the first one? I always liked the first one. I thought it was one of those silly little stupid pictures that, that worked, you know. Yeah, I, I agree, yeah. and the stupidity is in um, full effect here, only the, the silliness is pretty brutal. Um, okay, the duff. Talk about movies that harken back to other films. I remember when teen comedies hit their height with uh, movies like Heathers and Mean Girls, you know, the high school cliques and such, the Duff turns that on its head and does a great job of it and makes for a very appealing and funny film uh, with Mae Whitman, who as a little girl voiced Lilo in the Lilo and Stitch cartoons and has done, I think she's on Parenthood on TV, and she's a perfect bundle of she was, snark. She was, she was also on Arrested Development, too. Uh, I, I'm not sure which of these TV shows she was on, but there you go. Yeah. She's she's good. She's sharp. Uh, anyway, the Duff is an acronym. And even though in high school today, nerds have a lot of cachet, and they're not at war with jocks like they traditionally were in the past, um, there is still the Duff, the designated ugly fat friend. So Mae Whitman's character has two really beautiful popular friends, and she's sort of the duff, and it, it weighs heavily on her. She's smart and, and resourceful. Um, Ken Jeong plays her favorite teacher. He's pretty funny in this. Robbie uh, Amell, who plays the Flash's uh, pal Firestorm on TV, is the handsome goofball next door who she has a kind of eh, a little contentious relationship with, but they, they've been friends since they were little. It's really good of kind, as we like to say. I think people are going to be pleased with it who go see it. Uh, kids and uh, even the occasional adult who would probably catch it on the, on you know streaming or cable. I liked The Duff, honestly. Unbelievable. Uh, Allison Janney uh, play, plays the mom. You know, it, it's good. Uh, McFarland USA is kind of boilerplate, uh, you know, underdog against the odds, sports movie fodder. Uh, but it means well. It's based on a true story. It's about a 1987 um, high school cross-country team in uh, like the uh, Central Valley or Bakersfield. It's out there in the sticks in California, heavily Latino. And here comes Whitey in the form of Kevin Costner's character, uh, who was forced to take a job in this disadvantaged area when he kind of screws up the previous job he uh, does in a, in a nicer community as uh, the football coach. And in this case, you know, he finds himself and he inspires the kids, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, it, you know, For what this is, not bad. You get Maria Bella, uh, Maria Bella playing his wife, 
you get a, a whole slew of uh, young, uh, rising uh, Hispanic actors, uh, and you even get a few familiar faces in that regard. I, you know, I, not my cup of tea. I mean, it means well. It didn't do much for me. All right. My cup of tea. My favorite film out there today. And you, and you know that this makes sense for me because we've been buddies for a while. Kingsman, The Secret Service. To me, it was like fun, fun, and more fun. Homage to the over-the-top elements of like 60 spy movies. A little of director Matthew Vaughn's interest in the British class system, which showed up in his first uh, directorial effort, Layer Cake. I mean, it, it, straight out of Austin Powers. I mean, yeah, baby. But even smarter and kind of uh, sharper. An aimless but resourceful London street kid is recruited by a super-secret organization dedicated to to protecting the world from evil. So you bring in a, uh, an elegant and stylish British actor like Colin Firth, doing his best gentleman spy routine, kind of like John Steed on TV's Avengers. You get an actual icon of the 60s spy craze in Michael Caine, playing the boss of the, the, uh, the Kingsman. And you throw in a hip-hop nerd villain. Hip-hop nerd. A lisping mix of Dr. Dre and Mark Zuckerberg. And as uh, megalomaniacal as both of those guys, played by Samuel L. Jackson. There's like these high-tech fight scenes that are phenomenal. There's an assassin with a creepy set of skills and, and weapons, as if straight from one of those more ridiculous mid-period James Bond films. Uh, this, this woman, I, I don't even want to get into the details of that because it's so much fun to watch. I really enjoyed uh, The Secret Service, a.k.a. Kingsman. And it's from a, a it's from a graphic novel, and they did a great job. Yeah, I thing. wanted to go see it last weekend, and we bought tickets at the Comfy Chair Theater, and uh, we went down there, and uh, uh, a pipe broke in the lobby, and they had to chase everybody out of the theater, and we couldn't go see the movie. Well, it's pretty brutal, uh, and it's pretty tongue in cheek, and you know, you're so familiar with film uh, tropes and with these genres that I think it'll play really well with you. But you know, I don't want to oversell it. Oh wait, I already did. How about if I undersell something? Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay, Based let's move on to the next <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, I just want to say. Um, that this movie, based on the E.L. James bestseller, which I hear is pretty weak sauce, I haven't read it, uh, but for people that actually enjoy uh, sadomasochism or bondage and, uh, and such... Do you want me to uh, tell you right now a better movie to go watch if you're a woman who's seeking out that kind of storyline and would like it well done and extremely sensual and sexy, just rent Secretary. Thank you. Exactly. You couldn't have been more right. That is a fantastic, sexy movie about uh, bondage. Uh, well, mostly about you know uh, dominance and submission in, sure, in a relationship. Sure. It's, it's great. So, James Spader. Yeah. From TV's Blacklist, I yeah. have to say that because that's how things are now. Yeah. Uh, and Maggie Gyllenhaal from TV's uh, The Honorable Woman. That's yeah. right. That's how we're going to ID her. In Secretary is so much sexier and better than this movie. Oh, and the there's dialogue more, and there's, everything. There, there's more S and M in it too than there is in supposedly in uh, in in Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, yeah. Well, the dialogue and acting are spotty at best and laughable a lot of the time. And the chemistry between the leads, uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie Dornan from uh, The Fall, which is a pretty cool TV show if you, can, if you can check it out, and the daughter of Melanie Griffith and Don Johnson, Dakota Johnson. The chemistry is so uneven in this thing. So I thought it might be preferable. I mean, I really... I went into this thing, oh, Fifty Shades of Grey. I would have liked it better if it was about Jay Leno's ever-changing hair color. That's what I thought Fifty Shades of Grey would have been better as than it was. Hey, look, I'm, I'm a straight guy. I would have preferred Fifty Shades of Gay. I mean, this thing is pretty damn bad. That's all I'm going to say, uh, and, and I'm just going to get off the subject, mm -hmm. other than suggesting, wow, is it successful, and wow, here comes the sequel, like it or not. Yeah. You know, you know what's coming, right? What the sequel? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. How many? How many millions? Three hundred million? I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, okay, talking about big money. Um, let's uh, see if we can just put the final nail on the coffin of Jupiter ascending. Uh, you didn't see this, did you? No, and I was warned not to. Uh, the first truly ridiculous science fiction blockbuster of the year, 
or the first misfiring big budget comedy of the year because I laughed at this more than I laughed at Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, in either case, it's a multi-million dollar wank fest from the Wachowskis who did The Matrix and then put out these two laughable Matrix sequels and they set a standard for uh, oh, WT effery, let's put it that way, yeah. that has held through Speed Racer and Cloud Atlas. I mean, uh, it's like director J Terry Gilliam of Monty Python in Brazil and Time Bandits had a nightmare. Is there, after, any, way, is after, there, any, is there any way that uh, the one bro, uh, the one sister now could put yeah. his dick back on? Well, you think that would make them better? I think it would, yes. <laughs> well, I really, So imagine Terry Gilliam has a nightmare after watching Flash Gordon, the one from 1980, and having too much pizza, and then sat down and watched Katy Perry's Super Bowl halftime show and said, I'm going to make a movie just like that. Uh, because, uh, in fact, Terry Gilliam has a damn cameo in this movie. So Mila Kunis is the Katy Perry character. I mean, I mean, Jupiter. Jupiter Jones. That's right. That's her name. Mm -hmm. She's a Russian emigre in the States cleaning toilets who finds out she's the queen of outer space when Channing Tatum shows up. Uh, in the role, I guess, of Ashton Kutcher. Um, and Eddie Redmayne is in this thing. Eddie Redmayne in this movie, the guy who's nominated for an Oscar this weekend, is Nicolas Cage as the Emperor of Outer Space. That's how much, like, scenery chewing the guy does. I thought, why well, just get Nicolas Cage for this? Um, Sean Bean, Gugu Mbatha-Raw, and James Darcy are all in this. Three oh, fantastic geez, actors. I'm like, what? You know, you know what? I don't know what to say. I'm having uh, enough trouble with with James Darcy as it is because I I watch him on uh, Agent Carter and love the character he plays and love right. his acting, and then I go over and I watch Broadchurch and I don't realize it's the same guy. He's that oh, man. He's that good an actor. He is that good an actor. I saw the first uh, his first appearance in the new Broadchurch, and I was like, wow, what a creepy guy. And then the credits ran, and I went, oh, my God, it's Jarvis. It can't, can't be Jarvis. Uh, so great. So in this movie, you see Kunis cleaning toilets, Tatum shooting through the sky on a rocket-powered pair of skates, and Redmayne eating another piece of outer space scenery. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, wow. So I had fun watching it because it was so stupid. And it's sparkly and, and filled with explosions. And I can see it getting a second life as like a midnight movie, like a neo-Rocky horror show minus the songs. But Jupiter Ascending is a, it's a bomb of massive proportions, an interstellar bomb, if you will. Yeah. All right, so what do you want to see? Uh, none of this stuff. Uh, Seventh Son, also pretty bad. Sword and Sorcery crap. I think it's already out of the theaters. Jeff Bridges yeah. and Julianne Moore uh, cash in a check, right? Yeah, yeah. Huh? But I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm going to recommend a movie that I loved. And it's a film from Italy. And yes, you have to read subtitles. Oh, well, it's okay. You have to read subtitles. Uh, Human Capital. It's this potent, riveting, kind of funny at, at times, and heartbreaking uh, ensemble drama uh, that starts with a guy on a bicycle being run off the road by an SUV on the night before Christmas and then retraces the steps of a handful of these intertwined people going back six months. Um, the only name you might recognize from the uh, from the cast is uh, Valeria Galino, who was in uh, the second Pee Wee Herman movie. But man, this is a good film. Human Capital, just yeah. a, a wonderful movie. Yeah, and and uh, and for the kids, we can't um, not recommend uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. Sponge out of water. Our friend Tom Kenny and and the gang uh, doing a. a Big screen movie. It's pretty fun. It's it's, it's fun stuff. Uh, definitely fun stuff. Yeah. So, well, there you go. That's a that's a big dose of movies out in the uh, theaters right now for you. And that's and all the, the stuff. And, and it gets us up to date from all the stuff that you had uh, sitting there. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's talk for a moment about the dullest show on earth, uh, the uh, the the um, uh, Oscars, which is the poor man's BAFTAs. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. That's right. <laughs> well, the Baptists, for those who don't know, are the British Academy Awards. Maybe they're also the you poor know, man's. And, and they get they get Stephen Fry out there. He introduces people. They they give out the award, and it's one right after the other, and and nobody gets hurt, and everybody's out in two hours. Bang, yeah. bang, bang. Yeah, and done with the posh British accent, a received pronunciation, if you will. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you know, a lot of fun. And meanwhile, we have. Uh, uh, America's uh, Toastmaster, Neil Patrick Harris, which is a step up from America's uh, whining, dancing Muppet, Ellen DeGeneres. Yeah, but, well, you um, know something, though. He says he's not going to do much of a song and dance number. 
that that's what he does on the on the uh, Tonys, and he doesn't want to be predictable. So I think he's going to do songs and dances. I, but I, I think he will anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, he's also going to be more charming than, than Ellen, I, despite Middle America love. And her. also, as a difference uh, from Ellen, he's deciding to do the show as being not gay. So well, it'll, it'll be exciting. That's a real change of pace <laughs> yeah, for him. Right. Hey, look, the guy is. He's he's terrific. He's like a five tool player, as we say in My baseball. Girlfriend, girlfriend can't stand him, but uh, you know, she secretly wants him to be hers, and she knows that he'll never go for a woman. Right, right. Uh, okay, so here's the deal: yeah. um, Boyhood versus Birdman. Your take on that? Well, I would have to give it to Boyhood, I guess. But I, you know, it, both of these films are completely. In fact, all the films that are out this year, no matter who gets nominated, will be totally forgettable five years from now. I mean, how many times do you go back and watch most of these Oscar-winning movies? I mean, Ordinary People over, you know, Raging Bull? Give me a break. At the end of well, the, the, the end of the decade, they named Raging Bull the number one movie of that uh, decade, and uh, Ordinary People wasn't even an afterthought. You know, so are we going to remember Birdman? Are we going to remember Boyhood? Uh, you know, Boyhood is a film that for about half of it is totally dull, but you're carried along by the fact that these people are growing older. And then it gets kind of good at the end. But it, uh, overall, it's an if we forget the gimmick, okay, it's an okay film, just okay. Birdman, I thought, was utterly pretentious. And well, but, uh, you know, I, I granted, I think in a lot of ways, Birdman's appeal, and I thought it was very clever at what you, you know, one man's pretentious is another man's clever. But I will say that the Hollywood community, that's right, and put that in quotes and big capital letters, yeah. has a real tendency to reward their own, uh, particularly when someone comes out of the wilderness and uh, reestablishes their skill set. So, you know, you get things like, uh, oh, and also there are there are consolation prizes. There are all sorts of stuff in, uh, at awards season. So Sandra Bullock uh, does what is essentially a, uh, a lifetime movie, and not a very good one, called The Blind Side, and beats far superior performances for the Oscar for her body of work. Yeah. Michael Keaton does a movie that is sort of a meta view of his own career through a cracked funhouse mirror mm -hmm. about a guy who does a superhero uh, franchise then basically disappears for a while and then tries to reestablish his bona fides and he's doing it with this movie in real life and in fact the movie is well made by a, a very good director uh, it's good it's script. a very it's a very accomplished film i mean the gimmick of a uh, one uh, camera shot throughout the whole movie which hitchcock did years ago without special effects to make it work okay um uh it, it, was, it was it was was interesting but that's a gimmick the drums right. throughout the whole thing drove me nuts you know it's just a pretentious movie um uh, if i had to pick a movie uh i suppose my favorite film of the year is grand budapest hotel uh, you are not alone in saying this uh, uh, another a friend and colleague said this a couple nights ago and um, interesting, uh, that was the movie that I left humming the art direction because it was so visually but dazzling. It also, it's more than that, I mean, it's been on HBO now, and I've gotten to watch it not once, not twice, maybe three or four times. And it's just fun, and the performances are exquisite, and the script is fun. I mean, everything about it is just, it's something I can go back to five, ten years from now and watch again. Okay. Well, this this is good because uh, my v first viewing of it, I went, oh, I like Moonrise Kingdom better. And by that comparison, I thought, oh, this is maybe one of my lesser uh, uh, favorite uh, movies too, by Wes Anderson. Too, too, but but yeah. no, I'll watch it again if you if you say so. I I think it it's worth more viewing, and you might be uh, onto something here. Oh, it's it's a, it's a uh, it's an evergreen. I mean, you could show this 30 years from now and people would enjoy it. But anyway, that's my favorite picture of the year. But let's get to the best acting performance of the year. Well, it, it, to me, it's between Eddie Redmayne, who won the BAFTA first performance, as Stephen Hawking. I thought he, uh, it, I thought he was mediocre, but go ahead. It, no, but I'm saying I'm, this is who I perceive of if we use the uh, BAFTAs and other award ceremonies as bellwethers. 
Eddie Redmayne versus Michael Keaton. But I think that the Cumberbatch was fantastic. I think Cumberbatch, and, Cumberbatch of all of them, was the one that I would give it to. Okay, because uh, he was playing a a role that isn't Cumberbatch. You know, I, I often I, the thing I've told people about um, uh, the uh, what, what's the what's the, the name of the the theory of everything is that I could do that part sitting down. <laughs> Eddie Redmayne as but, Stephen Hawking, now, whereas you, Cumberbatch. You've got to realize you've got to realize the heavy lifting in that film isn't Redmayne. It's uh, what's her name. The, the actress uh, who plays Felicity, his wife. Felicity Jones. Felicity Jones. Felicity, she does the hard yeah. lifting. He basically, after the first third of the movie, doesn't have any lines. You know, and he just, you know, it's that old thing about if you play a cripple, you'll win the Academy Award. Or or the victim of, uh, of genocide. That also helps. Well, that helps, too. But if you're a victim of genocide who's crippled, oh, boy. <laughs> You hey, to... wait, hang on a second, and gay. And gay. Okay. Yeah, okay, so here's, no, here's no, the no, but, no, but, but, but it's, important, it's, important, it's important that the actor who is playing the gay guy is straight. Okay? That's true. Because then everybody goes, ooh, look, he kissed a guy and he's straight. Say, right. ooh, let's give him the Academy Award. Okay. And we call that Katy Perry uh, syndrome. And, and, you know, it, I kissed the girl. Yeah, yeah. I, Keaton isn't even in it for me. You know. Well, it's weird because he's sort of the, the front runner in a lot of cases. But uh, Cumberbatch is playing Alan Turing in The Imitation Game and is an important character that people should know about who's been out of the public eye. There's a lot of good reasons to want to see that win. Although, again, I hate all these awards uh, ceremonies in the arts. Um, but those are the three that I think are the, are the uh, front runners. Okay. And now, uh, how about Best Actress? Um, I think that uh, Julianne Moore is almost a shoe in she's for shoe, Still Alice. She's a shoe in again. Another one of those films that's kind of a stunt. You know what I'm saying? In other words, again, you're playing Alzheimer's, okay, as opposed to playing guy in wheelchair with ALS. Well, I mean, no, it's it's early onset. Oh man, she's still sort of hot Alzheimer's, so it's really horrible. Yeah. Uh, uh, I thought she was good. I thought she was very good, but I would give it's it. Still, to, I would yeah. give it to Felicity Jones. I really well, would. Uh, in both cases, I don't think the movies are anywhere as good as um, the Imitation Game. But I wouldn't give it to Kira Knightley, who is yeah. You, you know, you could put any. You could put Tuppence Middleton in there. Another it, woman yeah, with a yeah, weird name. Yeah, but I mean, Kira Knightley was pretty much Kira Knightley in the film, but. Uh, I've seen Felicity Jones and other stuff, and she has uh, she has a broad uh, um, palette. And uh, uh, in this film, uh, she is amazing. I mean, she is the she's the soul of the of the of the film. Yeah, and and I will say um, that because of being out here, I've had the chance to meet her, and she's super nice. And she's a Doctor Who veteran. She was in an episode of Doctor Who as a jewel thief. And so I like her even more. Well, so you know, you... but the fact is, she isn't going to win. It's going to be it's going to be Julianne Moore because she played somebody with Alzheimer's. All right. Well, you yeah, know, still uh, Julianne. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and and very good. She's very good in that picture. I'm I'm not complaining about it, but she's not terrific. You know, no. she's not well, as good as she doesn't turn in a Brevere performance like uh, Felicity Jones. And you kind of want to dock her for playing the insane witch in Seventh Son, which, again, is no longer in yeah. theaters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, we, uh, um, we we could go to Best Supporting Actor. You know, probably that's going to go to what's-his-name from Boyhood. I think it's going to go to J.K. Simmons for Whiplash. Oh, but excuse I'm just... me, it will go to J.K. Simmons. I'm sorry. I forgot about J.K. Simmons. He's won every award so far. Right. And is sensational in that movie. Truly. Which, uh, quite frankly, was an amazing film. I loved it. I just loved yeah, it. Yeah, best performance by Miles Teller uh, in his young career as the uh, as the central uh, uh, young man yeah. with the drum set. But, you know, everybody, he's going to win it because of several reasons. Number one, he's really good in the film, so that, that counts for something. Probably will be the only really deserving person, actor, to get their award. Uh, but also because we all just like him. He's been around for so long doing so many things, uh, including the State Farm commercials, 
that, uh, Jay Jonah Jameson, and yeah. uh, thank you. It's Farmers Insurance, my friend. Far, it is looks it like Farmers. The, Excuse me. The commercials aren't working. Oh my God! It's oh, God. Not it, 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 yeah, it's State Farmers Insurance. I would love to see Dennis Haysbert face off against J.K. Simmons yeah. in sort of <laughs> the insurance wars or something. That would be fun. But he'll but, he'll he'll win it. I think hands down. So yeah. And as for the rest of the stuff, you know, do we care? Um, I don't know. Patricia Arquette will get Best Supporting Actress. That might be the only award. Boyhood wins if Birdman does what it's done at the Directors Guild, etc. I think it might get Best Writing for an original, you know, yeah. thing. It might get Best Writing. But uh, I, I don't think Boyhood's going to w- walk away with everything like uh, it did in some other places. And when you, we have the Independent Film Awards on Saturday, which a lot of people will be listening to this past that time... Um, probably Boyhood will pick up everything, you know, in the Independent Spirit Awards. But, you know, so uh, anything else about the Oscars? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to watch. I'm in Los Angeles. You have to watch in L.A. or they actually kick you out. Um, I'm thinking that um, um, as much as I disdain uh, these things, I have to watch them so we can talk about them. So I'm on board. What about you? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm on board. The only problem we have here is that the Oscars uh, go on at uh, 8 o'clock at night, and uh, people like Girlfriend have to get to sleep by 9.30, you know, 10 o'clock. Sure. And uh, that, that you know, uh, that that's a, that's a real problem. I remember once watching the Oscars at 4 o'clock in the morning in London. Uh, and, and in London, if you want to see them live, that's when you have to get up to watch them. So, a conundrum. A but conundrum. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, and Tell we're watching them. stuff on TV and what yeah. have you. But let's uh, roll it up. Well, here. let's ran really long. You now have your own show. Uh, Woo-hoo! But that's okay because we had a lot of stuff to talk about. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's a catch up. Okay, Michael, tell them where they can find you. You can find me at Twitter at Culture Blaster. Check in, and also on Facebook at the Michael Snyder's Culture Blast page. And on GabNet. Okay, it's Culture Blast, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Snyder. Thank you, Michael. All righty.